All right, well, what we're going to be doing today is kind of an introduction and uh, kind of an overview of an understanding of where things are with our present food system, uh, just in order to provide the context for other things in this class, in this course, but then beyond that, the actual work that you would be doing as extension agents, as field faculty or specialists, connecting with and engaging in this question, because it really is a, a fundamental question that we all have as we work, as we work with producers, as we consume foods, is thinking about uh, our food, where it comes from, and the system that it comes in. Um, global and local are two ends of the spectrum, but uh, they're just things to think about as we go forward. So anyhow, that's what we're doing today. Uh, given this background, given this overview, I think you'll have the opportunity to be uh, reading and thinking and talking about it as you go forward. And um, we're very excited to be starting this. It's been a while in process and for us to actually get something going um, and getting it out to people is just really exciting. So um, I'm John O'Sullivan and I am, let's move to this next uh, slide right here. I'm John O'Sullivan. I have been the director and been involved in SEFS, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems for a number of years. I just retired this past year. Uh, was a faculty member at A&T, um, North Carolina A&T State University since 1983. It's the 20th anniversary of CEFS too, as we've got in these slides. So um, we've been at this a little while, enough so that it's not brand new, but as we'll be talking and thinking about it, uh, it's just the beginning of a process. So uh, we're all excited about this and really encouraged that there is interest in this across the state and other states, our neighboring states, um, as it is, it is an important question for the future of agriculture. Um, what we want to be really focusing in on and thinking about is the evolution and developments in these processes. And um, I'm not a hard scientist. Uh, I, my background, is, as you'll see, is in history and the social sciences. And I frequently joke with our um, my good friends who are the scientists doing all that great research, that they sometimes forget the context, especially the human context of what's going on. And they can be so right on with a breed of a plant, with a process, but if it doesn't fit with the human context, then it might not go anywhere. And so let's be talking about uh, global and local food systems intelligently with the recognition of the uh, evolution. How did we get here? How did we get here? Where's it going? Why is it going? Why has it gone the way it has gone? Where, where, where might it go? Where are the touch points uh, maybe to bring about some changes? So those are kinds of the things that I'd like to um, go forward with. Um, and, and I'm sure you all know we're all talking these days in terms of systems. Everyone recognizes that everything is part of a system. And whether you're looking at a particular breed of a plant or a marketing approach, it's all part of systems. And we recognize that. But that's easily said. And then how do we impact it? And how do we make something happen? Um, we must recognize in all of this that we're at a point in the journey of humanity. Um, when all said and done, hu human civilization, human culture, humanity itself in many, many ways is defined by food. And um, that's an important thing to recognize. We are, when we start messing with people's food, we are mecha frequently messing with what is sacred to them. We could very easily do that. And um, as we have evolved as a species, these questions of distribution of crops and animals, control of land and, and labor to produce things, civilization itself evolved out of the control of distribution of production and markets and access to things. Um, and then setting up this transportation system so that we can, people can get it where it's needed. And we could go back to Egypt, we could go back to Babylon. Stories are the same. We go back to the Mayans. Stories are the same, because these are the same questions just as today. Um, but maybe a, a little more seriously, are we at a tipping point in this question? I think that's kind of where we are with our wonder. Um, we have been able to do so much, especially since World War II, in terms of our production expertises. But 
What about agriculture and the environment? Where are we with it? And then other issues, food access, and rights. Is, is, is there a right to food? Is there a right to good, clean water? Or does that not matter? Those are the kinds of questions that we're at now. Um, as well as the human choices about food and food systems, as I've said, they're part and parcel of family. Um, family meals are so much more about the gathering of the family than the meal and the stories and the way food is prepared and who gets involved and all of that stuff. And so that probably matters as we go on forward. Agriculture as an occupation. Is it valued in our society? Why or why not? And how do we help make something different? Uh, it's easy to say, wow, let's have good food and we aren't ready to pay for it and things like that. Um, and then farming connected to consumers, what we in, in extension frequently call ag literacy. People don't know anything about food. If it's something done by somebody else, and that's, that's it, uh, where, where, how do we go forward with these things? Anyhow, as you can tell, I mean, I come from this with a wide diversity of backgrounds. Uh, I started in this question with Peace Corps in, in West Africa, uh, doing uh, village level research with producers. I've been in Cooperative Extension in North Carolina for 30 plus years, farm management and marketing. Um, work with Southern SARE, so I've got a broader vision of the South, lived in Alabama for five and a half years and such, uh, as well as traveling around the world. So I've been a professor on the Semester at Sea program a couple of times, and I've taken students to visit fishermen and, and farmers and gardeners across the world, as well as here in North Carolina and, and around. So, my perspective is coming this kind of mix and, and feet in both camps, very definitely. Um, and as we talk about it, we have to recognize the strength of the global food system. It is awesome. It is amazing. Um, for those of us, I just flew into to New York City. When you fly into the big cities and you think of all the food that has gotten in there day in and day out and the waste that's removed and all of that is just incredible what has been developed. Um, to do that, we've had to standard, people who are into this stuff have had to standardize products, had to define it, had to make it so that it could fit into an endless stream such as that. Uh, in so doing, they've had to address these things of storage, shelf life, safety, the losses of products and things like that, manage that, understand it. Um, and then this whole thing that we developed as a strength in this is uh, transportable, transportability of our foodstuffs and how do we do it. The cool chain, the development of the railroads in the United States with the refrigerated cars, moving food from California, Florida, Texas to the cities in the Northeast uh, as being a mechanism that got fresh fruit, food to people as well as meat and things like that quality maintenance and travel times and how much more sophisticated that has gone along as we have proceeded. So the old days of putting ice into the refrigerator cars evolved into the big uh, railroad cars and tractor trailers that are uh, temperature controlled, that have logs so that people know exactly what the temperature is and on and on. But look further down into this, think of uh, the financial aspects that need to be managed in something of this scale so that uh, ownership and financial integration are part and parcel of this. And then we get a distribution out to people with a certain quality standard so that people kind of know what they're getting. Or that there's uh, understanding on the part of the consumer and the supplier of what it is that we're talking about. Um, flip side of this now might be an alternative in which uh, a local system functions. And what, what might that look like or have as key um, elements. And this is just, again, my thoughts here, and I'm sure you'll be discussing this and thinking about it, both in terms of the course and in terms of your own work. But to me, there's certain uh, th ways in which we have a, an, a niche, let's say, an identifiable product, a, a footprint that people feel strongly is, is minimized rather than uh, using all the packaging, for example, and distribution and things like that. Um, tends to kind of really try to build the whole system, thinking from the ground, thinking from the soils, thinking from uh, maintaining the viability of all of that as being so very, very important. So 
At least to me, these are starting points for conversations of thinking of a global system, what it looks like and what it needs to be, and a local system and what it might need to be. And there are many other elements, and, and hopefully in different counties there are many elements, in different uh, states. So be thinking about it and, and trying to think of how to make it work to the benefit of all of us as consumers, as producers, and as uh, part and parcel of the global system of which we are strong members. Um, so, you know, just briefly, historically, food systems have been food production, transportation, storage, preparation, consumption, disposal of waste, and all tasks central to human economics, to human well-being, family, culture, and religion. And it is about nutrition. And I'm so impressed with what the uh, food scientists know about our nutrition needs. But it's also about culture. It's also about going to a market in which the people know each other, in which people expect certain products and, and get them ready in certain ways and offer them in certain ways. Um, organization of land and other resources. Um, being in Africa and, and working with farmers and knowing the system by which one had access to land, how important it was that it was the village elders and ultimately the religious leaders who decided, who said, mm, you're going to put, you're going to cut Mother Earth to grow something. You can't just do that without recognizing what you're doing and figuring out a way to make amends to the system. That was their way of looking at it. So organization of land and other resources, sacred forests, let's just chop down those trees. They're in the way. Wait a minute. That's the sacred forest. That's the cemetery of our, of our ancestors. We can't just be using it simply in terms of food production. Trade, markets, relationships. Um, no matter where we are, these are part and parcel of things. And it's interesting, you go into a big box store and um, getting to see the same people and them seeing you, building a relationship in a Home Depot or in a Walmart, it's, it's the same. It's interesting, isn't it, how, how human we are. Um, what I want to do here, and, and again, these are two extremes. I just want, and these are on the web, if you uh, Google uh, food system maps, there's a multitude of them. And I just want to give you two extremes. Uh, Kind of, again, be thinking about this. Suppose we were thinking of an ideal food system. We would want to have the elements of it, and you can see them here on the screen or, or find them on the web. But um, it's about uh, the environment over here and the west side of this picture. The north side talks about farming with all of the different aspects of management that are involved there. The economics in terms of access then to the food and the social and we've got supply and demand, we've got biological systems, we've got economic systems and economic taking it in the Greek sense of the word being about house, household and management. So it, it's that's the economics, that's the political system, they're all part and parcel of it there, yes. Um, so let's just have that as one end of a spectrum and then we can come up with a global food system such as we might need in the world today. And we can look at all the different aspects of it and we might recognize that in a certain sense we do have a fractal, that we have to go up and down, that there are parallel systems, but we can perhaps create a system that is just so complicated that is outside of the realm of where things uh, are manageable in, in a true sense. And maybe that's where the tensions are that some people are feeling, and which is why maybe there's a lot of interest in local, knowing your farmer, protecting agriculture in a particular place, recognizing, my goodness, how are we supposed to protect agriculture in Orange County, North Carolina? Where is that in this, you know, is, is a question you might have as a citizen living in, in Orange County or wherever you are, and especially people in extension who have roles in terms of working with producers and consumers and political leaders and helping people understand where we are so that uh, on the one hand this, this uh, is useful to look at and think about. Um, so anyhow, I, I wanted to put those kind of as the polar opposites to uh, ends of a spectrum. 
Now, we again go back to the global system. There are pros to it. It has been great in certain ways. Reduction of global famine since World War II. I mean, you know, the old uh, pictures of the lack of food in India and China or Africa. Um, the ones that have occurred since then have been because of war and ways that people couldn't get food into people who needed it. So it's just been amazing. Beyond that, going back in history, and we'll mention this, the Columbian Exchange. When we start thinking about what happened when Columbus left Europe, came to the New World, the foods that he found and where they ended up, is enough to really make you say, oh my goodness. For example, um, in, on the trip around the world, we uh, were down in Brazil and saw our mindset was about New World agricultural products. We ended up, uh, not ended up, but on our journey, we were in China. China, of course, has the world's largest uh, consumption of pork, has the and pigs coming from Asia, by the way, over toward Europe. But um, most of the pigs in, in China, just like in the rest of the world, are fed grains, especially corn. And corn is a new world crop. So that as we began this trip with my students, we were talking about this global and local, and then they brought in the question about um, indigenous foods, which is something to be thinking about as well. Um, and we were, by the point we got to China, having rousing arguments about what is local and what is global. And when is global and when is local. Um, because it, it is thought-provoking what we have done as human beings. Um, Colombian exchanges, we'll see, we've got a little bit of a graphic of the things that are carried back and forth. And those are both good things, like corn, and bad things like all the weeds we've distributed around uh, or things that got out of our control, kudzu here in the south, you know, and many other things, Johnson grass, you named so many things. Um, so, you know, we've, got, we've done amazingly in terms of creating a global, global food system. In so doing and with the technologies, look at the reductions in cost per unit of output, dispersal of, food, of income from food production, how it has spread around the world so that for example, now, uh, you know, corn for um, uh, China is coming from Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, as well as the United States. It's just amazing. Green Revolution, incredible yield increases which have been done um, based on industrial inputs and management systems. But again, are we at perhaps a tipping point in terms of something else? Um, pictures from around the world, and as you can see, I've just laced these in here that uh, Bananas being put on a, a ship on, over on one side in big containers. Uh, the other picture here is they're loading tuna off of a ship in Manta, Peru. And that's coffee uh, plantations and coffee houses in uh, Costa Rica, western Costa Rica. Um, so the, it's around the world. It is, it is well connected. Um, a lot of this did develop in the Mediterranean, which again, as you think of it, um, those of us who study a little Latin and Greek, you know, Mediterranean, the middle of the earth. In the old days, when travel across land was so difficult, water was the way to travel. And so we didn't have the Mediterranean in Europe and Africa and Asia. We rather had a, a main street with different areas that were accessing and drawing into the Mediterranean so that goods could be moved around. And, uh, yeah, this is why the Roman Empire and later the Muslim Empires, as they conquered, they were built around the Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire, and things like that. But in, uh, as you know, around 1500, uh, Europeans, because of the development of some of their ships, were able to move across the Atlantic and move down around Africa and understand the globe as it occurred. Um, they made connections. Um, they claimed areas as possessions. They began, and, and this wasn't building empires in those days. I mean, the mindset of these places that they set up were called factories. The idea was that there were production centers of different things, commodities, um, mining, uh, people from Africa. The factories were set up on the coast of Gold Coast of Ghana, Elmina over there, 1471. Elmina, 
The mine is a Portuguese word, and it was where it was a, a slave fort, which people were brought in to be brought to the mines over in um, uh, the New World. So anyhow, that, this is kind of beginning of this connection. It bursts out of the Mediterranean. It goes forth with certain um, systems of production already in place, slave uh, production from the uh, Crusades and back in those days, Roman Empire, Greeks, uh, all back into that. Um, there's a product there too as well, as perhaps some of you know, and that was sugar. Azucar is the Arabic word. Um, and it was, um, Europeans became acquainted with it in the Crusades, saw the production system, saw they were dependent on the Arab traders and Muslim world, and they said, hmm, what do you know about that? Maybe we can do that. That's the start of really what goes forward out of, out of the system. Um, and uh, over time, an Atlantic trade system develops. Again, you know this from probably high school history. This is really the, the base of the local, of the food system, global food system. So that we've got uh, slaves, items being brought from uh, Africa, not, a, not just Africa originally, there were indigenous uh, indentured servants from Europe that were brought. Barbados, for example, had uh, uh, white worker sugar plantations for years and years. And then products were being brought. Uh, look at uh, there, you've got rice that came from, for example, South Carolina. That was African expertise, and it was a product now that was shipped as uh, their listed silk and indigo. Tobacco was a new world product. Sugar, molasses, wood, you, you can, you know this stuff already, but it, this is the flow of it that was created. Manufactured goods, um, raw materials. Here's that Colombian exchange I was mentioning, and you can see products being, and, and other things coming from one side, transported to the other. Um, you know, look at uh, coming from the old world, old world from the perspective of the Europeans and Africans. Uh, for example, uh, if you look over there, the cattle are brought. Uh, sheep, pigs, horses came from, the, the pigs came from China, came across Asia, brought into Europe, developed a little bit of breeding in, in England. They're moved to um, the New World. Cattle, I'm going down to Uruguay, which is why I'm doing this uh, as a, uh, this kind of presentation. And in Uruguay, there are millions and millions of cattle grazing the pampas, of Uruguay and uh, Argentina, and they were brought from, from the old world, from, from uh, Europe. From um, the new world came all sorts of awesome things, such as uh, uh, corn, such as tomatoes, potatoes, peanuts, different kinds of peanuts. It's, uh, there are many products such as peanuts that have different um, uh, ways in which they've evolved in different places. In West Africa, we had a local peanut, wanzu is what it was called. And they would make a peanut sauce, and now they would use the New World uh, peanut as well. So it's a trade system that was uh, created out of uh, this uh, con context, uh, context. And so uh, what I would say is uh, yesterday's commodity trade, national policies and empires are the base for today's systems. The British and the Dutch Spanish and the Portuguese. And the Dutch and the British, Dutch especially, are the ones who created the joint stock company. Remember I talked about the finances and ownership and bringing together capital to make this stuff work. The Dutch and the um, British did such a better job of that than did the Spanish, the Portuguese, or even the French. Um, but they all developed different models and, and they came up with ways of um, moving commodities, and the commodities might be people. Um, uh, one of these vessels here is a slaver that is being uh, uh, boarded by a, another vessel, and uh, this is part of the roots of um, that system. Uh, here we are today, and, and again, this is just a global system today. Uh, we were in uh, the Panama Canal, and that picture shows a ship that was designed to fit in the locks. There's 10 inches clearance on each side. It fits like your finger in your glove, that big thing. That's a car transport, it's not a, a container vessel. But it is designed, it's called a Panamax. 
to fit into the Panama Canal. Well, as, as I'm sure you know, they're expanding the canal. They've got new locks being built, um, and that's what the bottom picture is. We were going through the canal two years ago. Uh, they're approaching finishing that, the new locks. But already there are ships that are going to be too big for the new locks. And so it's just, there's this drive for efficiency toward one item, uh, fuel or tra transportation or things like that. And where are we? I mean, we've got TNCs, transnational corporations. Transnational, who's in charge? Who's in charge? They run the global food business and every energy business and things like that. They're beyond, they're much bigger than the U.S. government in terms of management or anybody else. But nation states are, in theory, in charge with rules, and now with a drive to cut government, very little in order to be responsive, to handle the responsibilities they have. People scream about chemical use or pesticides on uh, food products, but then there's no money to pay for inspectors. Okay, that's just, okay, that's our system. We have international arbitration that has evolved, and a number of, of things that you might know about or will be hearing about or part and parcel of the world of um, international food. GAP, a General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, WTL, World Trade Organization, Codex, it, which is the list and explanation and definition of what these products are, uh, Codex Alimentarius. Um, TBT, it is uh, Trade Barriers, uh, Tariff and Trade Barriers. Um, SPS, Sanitary and Phytosanitary Standards. These are the things that you can um, control or manage trade with, and they've got to be scientifically definable. Um, and you can't just be using words to protect local without and, and, and not get yourself in trouble with global trade. That is the point of this list here. Global gap. Um, one of the things we're going to be talking about in Uruguay is what's, what's going on in gap? And how does it in, how, what are the reactions and work of scientists there in terms of helping their producers deal with the standards so that their products move easily into the global system? And are they barriers for a country like Uruguay, which only has 3.5 million people? How are they supposed to um, be involved in this stuff? And then uh, as we move forward on this, and as I said, you know, nation states maybe not have all of the um, wherewithal to manage them, uh, we are definitely moving toward third-party certifiers who are frequently paid for by the companies, uh, the big uh, retailers and distributors. So, you know, uh, that has advantages and disadvantages in terms of cost. It also can be um, a marketing tool so that I could be trying to say as a distributor, my standards are more rigorous than your standards, and therefore you, people need to shop with me and not with you. It, you can see how these things can become games even in this kind of system, and they have become games. Um, We've, we've seen this kind of thing. And it just puts pressure on producers in terms of meeting standards that aren't substantive, even in the big system. And people say, oh, the local, you're starting to mess things up. Eh, the global system, that game can be played just as well. So um, be aware of where things are and where they're going. As I said, you know, we do, the global system has some negatives. Um, Reduction in ownership rights through concentration and patents. And I have to say this is um, really a concern for me. You wonder where we're going as we're able to patent things that are out there and then discovered. And a lawyer groups you know, are able to put together a patent statement. Uh, the left behinds in the process, you know. If there isn't a market, you see some of this with the Ebola discussions, you know. Well, if it's just the poor in Africa who are suffering, uh, they don't have a voice in the market. Uh, quinoa syndrome, you know, um, you know, as you get, um, we start hauling all of the products out of markets, out of production areas, and um, it was this a uh, food stuff up in the high Andes, and suddenly it's all at fancy grocery stores in the West. Uh, wait a minute, what am I supposed to feed my kids if I'm a 
village or up there by, uh, up in the Altaplano. Uh, well, we'll get your French fries from Idaho. Mm, I don't know. Reduction in crop and animal diversity due to production standardization. Again, this is potential issues, and uh, Rafi International is certainly, certainly working on um, uh, seed banks, as are others, corporations. Corporations holding them for their own future um, uh, access is, again, just a wonder about that. Um, and then finally, the environmental degradation due to externalizing costs and pressures to increase production. Um, and uh, we've seen this with uh, confinement livestock operations, with the pressures and questions about who bears the burden of waste especially in smells and um, obsolete uh, production systems that are just abandoned and they're left. Who's going to take it up? Who's going to fix it? Who's going to fix the Niger Delta after we've gotten all of that oil out of there? Um, anyhow, those are the kinds of things you think about as you're traveling around in uh, the Altaplano or in the Galapagos, which is that central picture, or in Belize as you're traveling. Um, and here's a container vessel. This is uh, 11,000 containers. It's already been well surpassed. There's one with 18,000, and the one they're working on with 21,000 containers on one vessel. And they'll come in, they're very big, they come into uh, west coast of the United States, or they come into Europe and they offload products, especially from the production um, hubs and centers of China. So just amazing how this system has worked and transformed um, distribution. Um, on the other hand, as we look at, at local, we just, uh, what are the words and how are they, how are they useful? How do they resonate with people? Are just things that I think we need to be cautious and respectful of. Um, local, organic, natural, permaculture, biointensive, sustainable, equitable, are all words that may really matter to people in terms of uh, what they value and therefore should be um, respected and perhaps they can act on them some way. And my thought would be, you know, to set it up so they can't act on what matters to them. It's a, it would be a loss of, of uh, our engagement as humanity. Over time, we've seen very interesting systems in which we've tried to respond to these questions. And you can go back in your history and um, conservation of nature, you know, the American uh, natural parks and the uh, uh, soil and water conservation, all of the efforts to do those kinds of things, Agricultural Adjustment Act and things like that. Um, ecology emerging as a question. Sustainability, sustainable development, the Brundtland uh, Commission report, 1987, the UN getting involved in this. Going back quite a distance, organic composting, soils. Sir Albert Howard was in India um, during the pre-World War II, post-World War II period, wrote some very important books on, on soils. Uh, Rodale being interested in the United States, biointensive, holistic resource management, sustainable agriculture, um, sustainability, We'd, we'd almost have to say and include in our uh, thought process that at some point we have recognized that there is an issue of sustainability going forward. And that in, we're in the midst of perhaps a paradigm shift, realizing, you know, you can't just go for the home run without thinking through the rest of the game. And so sustainability of not just thinking for ourselves, but rather down the road, became part and parcel of uh, USDA and SARE, the Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program in the late 1980s uh, and going forward with funding um, to help do that. As we look at, uh, for example, Europe, you know, the um, common agricultural policies there in Europe. Uh, Europe had the experience of having been the place of World War II and of having 1945 and 1946 nothing to grow, no seeds, no equipment, no way to produce food. And stripping bare their parks and killing and eating the squirrels, and everything. Because there was nothing in production in Germany and Belgium. Uh, the Dutch, the women learning how to eat tulips. 
because that's what they had. Um, so they said, you know, we don't want to do that again. We want to have food security. Hmm. How does that fit with this kind of question? Um, moving forward, uh, FSR slash E, uh, Farming Systems Research in the 1980s and 90s, trying to get um, participatory and engaging producers around the world. This was at the University of Florida and, and uh, Purdue and some of the other universities in the United States. Um, very strong effort to get uh, local producers and uh, systems involved. Slow food, you know, valuing things, the Italians. Um, AOC, Appellation d'Origine Controlée, French, the cheese and wine. In the U.S. to some extent we've got Fidelia onions and things. Um, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation has challenged us to not forget the equity and health aspects of these things. And then farm labor, you know, how, how fair is the system? And then students, um, who are so delightful on campus, being so idealistic and hopeful and looking at their institution and saying, let's push our institution to buy local or buy some other attribute. And, Certain places like Duke and others, uh, Chapel Hill, really done a great job. Others, uh, Clemson, really just doing some good things here at State. Things really looking looking for. And A and T, we got some new programs. So things going well. Yeah, let's just mention for a minute what's going on in North Carolina, because we in North Carolina at least followed our roots of extension, and um, went forward in 2008, 2010 with a farm to fork local food initiative, which we went out and talked to people, again, with cooperative extension model, listening to what people wanted, trying to figure out what mattered to them, seeing how we could integrate that into extension, which works so well with commodities, with producer groups, and how do we then go beyond that to other things. And uh, we had quite an experience, um, developed uh, ideas on things that really needed addressing, game changers, uh, resources of all sorts of people doing things across the state out here. And um, it really is a model for, for uh, here's the book, it's on the website of uh, Seth's The Farm to Fork. It's got some background and statistics, information about this. It's not just made up by people sitting on a campus. It's part of the conversation, we're part of it, I hope. But it is across and, and out here to the communities. Um, you know, with some prioritized, how do we, so what, you know? This is the question for, for people in extension is, out in your county, so what? What are you going to do in this county or that county? Does it make a difference? How do you know? How are you going to go about it? Um, and then how's it going to fit? And what resources do you have? And maybe beyond. So those are the things that, again, 10% campaign. Um, our argument, our thought is in North Carolina, at least we spent approximately $3.5 billion on food per year. What if we just kept 10% of that for local producers? Um, and so we've got cooperative extension, local food coordinators at least aware of and thinking of this as a mechanism to help inform consumers and to help uh, producers. Agriculture is changing, even with this slide, things are changing with prices of fuel going all over the place. But um, down there in the middle, it says uh, about 10 to 15 calories of fossil fuel are needed to create one ca uh, calorie of food. That, you wonder about that as a production system. You wonder about costs, you wonder about implications of a system that isn't necessarily seem as though it's um, recursive, that it's um, building up a mechanism of uh, long-term maintenance, uh, distribution and things like that. Um, there are changes going on, and you know this, you know this out in your counties and your cities, Great consumer interest, a lot of marketing, a lot of buzz, a lot of um, creating terms and claims, um, which we as, as uh, thoughtful, knowledgeable people who have science as a background, who know producers, who know distributors, um, we've got much to contribute to this to make it substantive and of value. Uh, there's just some information on that. And so what, what have we done? You know, here this map is kind of a it's not quite accurate in terms of the header, but um, from the mid 18th century until the end of World War I, we created an, a system built on empires and control of things. And then World War I and uh, World War I and World War II shattered that. But those networks are still there, so that Brazil's 
Portuguese connections and a Spanish-speaking world and on and on are, are there. Here's our, our container ships, just the scale of what we're doing. We're able to move products. Um, as we develop local responses, uh, these pictures I, th I think are a little interesting. We've got rice growing in Wayne County, uh, North Carolina, at that top picture at the small farm unit. Um, going back to something that had been brought in and was part of uh, an earlier system of production in the early colonial plantation times, uh, growing vegetables year-round, having community gardens to help people uh, have a better sense of what the culture was. And so there's um, things to be doing, done and connections and you know, uh, consumer awareness of costs of the global system, building local relationships, uh, protecting the environment, making local profitable. How are we supposed to do that? Who, who's going to do it if extension doesn't? Um, develop ag literacy so kids know where their food comes from. Future farmers. And then we do have this issue of how we're going to feed the 9 billion people in 2050 or whatever that question is. And who's we? How is it going to work? Um, certain people are trying to claim it as their um, right as, let's say, a big corporation. They've got all the answers. Well, I think what we've seen here and what you know from your work around counties, uh, life's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, we do know that we've got as much food now to feed the people we have now. We've done a great job of that. But there are systems in the way, and, and there are people hungry, probably in your own hometown. This thing, something's not working. How do we address those? those? Those are part of this question, as well as the simplistic production of, of food. Uh, things are changing here in the southeast. We've had a lot of loss of farmers, farmland and fishing. Average age of farmers is quite high. We have not done a good way, of, uh, done well of getting people involved, seeing it as a um, uh, successful, desirable lifestyle. Um, how do we make that happen? Or does it matter to us? I think it certainly matters to me that we have an agriculturally dynamic and viable North Carolina that is grounded here as well as connected globally. I mean, I don't have any big worries that Smithfield is now owned by a Chinese corporation, but I do like to have local food and local food access and decisions made about food here. Um, by us, for us. And there is consumer interest in this. We know that. And you no, know, I think that is the strength of the capitalist system is that consumers matter. And they vote with their dollars and that they should be aware of and, and act on information. And so uh, we, ought to, we ought to strengthen that. We ought to make that part of our food system. There's public health interest. We do have issues. I don't know what they, I can't say the direct connections, but there are issues of obesity and diabetes and health somehow tied to the way we live, our food, our exercise, whatever it is. We need to do a better job. We need to understand that to help people make the good food choices they want to make um, and have healthy lifestyles, unequal access and health disparities. Um, you know these kinds of things about the growth and the issue of uh, uh, obesity or overweight issues. And, uh, this goes on. It's not totally linear, but it is a pronounced um, trend in terms of uh, Americans getting bigger. Um, we at SAFs have taken on um, challenges recognizing this. For us, it's been a journey. and. Um, we see ourselves as being tied to the universities, part of Extension, part of uh, the departments, and then also with Extension and with our communities. And we believe that this stuff matters and that we want to be part of it. And that everyone should have equal opportunity to participate in the conversations, in the decisions, in access to this um, heritage of, Amer of, of human beings. We believe that communication and engagement of all will help address some of these things.
Um, we believe in integrity and in, in transparency. And when we're not as good as we should be, we want to be called on that. Um, we want everyone. Food matters. Food matters. We want that. We know that. We want to make sure that we are consistent in our actions and our values. Collaboration. We believe the universities, the part, North Carolina Department of Agriculture, people of North Carolina working together can do something about this. And it's in collaboration, it's in partnerships. Because if somebody thinks they got all the cards, hmm, it's going to fall apart. People are going to step back and away, they're going to cross their arms. They're going to remember other things. It's about going forward in this stuff. And then the last one we brought in is equity and social justice in our conversations, as challenged by Kellogg and others. Um, we see uh, a system that is not fair, that is not giving everybody a fair shake, that somehow we have, it's, it has been set up. And how do we change it? It's not blame, it's not guilt, it's, wow, how do we go forward with the issues that are right here in front of us? That's to me where the question is, and that's where the strength of extension and of learning and reading, um, learning from others is going to help us to get forward. And so we have been on a journey. This was our earlier map. Uh, I think we've got another one. Hopefully I've got the new one in here. Um, going forward from talking about the environment, that still matters. We still don't have very good answers there. We're working in systems there to try to help make that happen going forward into bringing people in markets and though in uh, NGOs and getting connected with consumers and finding funding resources so this is this is where we're this is where we're on a journey um, just as I talked about the journey the development of the global food system this is our journey as part of that um, and I don't know how we're going to get it across to people. I know economics is a language that we need to master better. Uh, but that, that's something to be thinking about. Multiplier effect, local, getting at this. That we don't just sit satisfied with our values. We act on them and we communicate them. Again, you'll, you'll see this, I presume it's in um, some of the materials that we've developed. Uh, be using it elsewhere, but understanding can, can helping local political and business leaders see the value of local to the economy um, is something not to be ignored, but that maybe pulls all of us out of our comfort zones of production into these kinds of questions. Um, and so, I, as I say, here's kind of our, we have evolved history of CEFs. Um, and it doesn't end there, and we're, here we are already in 2015, and we're really looking forward to the things that will be happening across the state through the cooperation of um, local food coordinators, other partners in the extension offices, and partners, nonprofits, schools, school board, um, child nutrition uh, directors military out here use so much of the food, want to have agriculture nearby, want to have farms. How do we get everybody working on this stuff? Um, we need to develop our skills to help make it happen, to facilitate it, to make the contributions of our knowledge uh, as we go forward. Well, I think that's uh, kind of it. I left a few references here. You've got them and Joanna will have others. Uh, with our project, with the website, other things, and some of the books that I certainly use to um, help bring this kind of thing together. So uh, thank you for your time. I know we're moving over into a um, uh, question and answer period, and I think Nancy, Dr. Nancy Creamer will help facilitate that, but um, uh, don't hesitate to email me, or I'm gonna be traveling for a little while, but um, I'd love to hear, and I'm definitely gonna keep my ear to the rail when I get back. I'm not going away permanently, but in uh, May, I'm gonna listen to all of the good things that have happened out of this uh, project. So really appreciate the opportunity to um, lay this out, and at least give you something to chew on uh, as you go forward.